we go. Welcome to another episode of Follow the Money, the show on institutional investors. I'm your host, Michael Manuel. These opinions are of myself and not over of SWFI. And today there's a lot of good breaking news. The first story of the day I want to talk to you about is Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. The South Korean government is uh, apparently they're drafting a law to possibly ban cryptocurrency trading and that kind of creates some tension in the cryptocurrency markets. Um, but as you know, laws take a long time to pass, so we'll see how that plays out. But uh, there's kind of a push and pull in the world of cryptocurrency in one area. Uh, there's a lot of uh, governments thinking about how they can regulate it, how can they protect investors from these, all these different kinds of, of, of altcoins that are coming out. I mean, Kodak just released its Kodak coin. Um, some of these coins have utility functions, some are, um, you know, as a store of value. So this whole concept of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies I find very fascinating. In fact, uh, there's been a sort of a split among the community of institutional investors on their viewpoints on cryptocurrencies and digital currencies. For example, at one point, Jamie Dimon was once saying that you know Bitcoin was a fraud at a, at a banking conference, I believe. And then he kind of changed his tune um, in a recent interview that was, uh, it's, it's all over the financial press. Um, but there are concerns. And uh, like I said, like with any new sort of product or market or service, there are always unsavory characters trying to it to really take advantage of those types of markets. But um, you know, just some more information on it. Um, a lot of uh, sovereign wealth funds and pensions are taking a deep look at. In fact, uh, Mubadla CEO once said um, in a CNBC interview that is something to you know look at. Um, they weren't swayed either way. Uh, I believe one of the private banks owned by Mubadla um, is, uh, they offered something in some sort of cryptocurrency. Um, I don't have, I'll get some more information on that. And then uh, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, um, their executive, Mark Matchin, was once quoted saying, um, it's still early to figure out whether this is truly investable and whether, whether cryptocurrencies really are liquid gold. Um, nonetheless, uh, CPPIB and other investors have put resources to kind of analyze um, cryptocurrencies and their impact on the investment world. Because it's, it's not only looking at it as an investment, which um, you know a lot of people on the institutional side are cautious, but in terms of how will it affect markets, how will it affect monetary flows, um, how will transactions occur, and uh, you know that's going to have an impact on a wide range of industries, such as the financial services industry, right? So again, um, like what Frederick Nietzsche once said, uh, he used to quote saying, translated, convictions are more dangerous enemies of truth than lies, okay? Convictions are more dangerous enemies of truth than lies. So you might see some people out there and they're really tied to their convictions on, hey, Bitcoin's the greatest thing in the world. Or, hey, Bitcoin's the biggest fraud in the world. Uh, you know, really examine those statements. Really think about, you know, what's behind them. Um, you know, what does that person stand for? What do they really believe in? Um, what are they trying to sell you? So, again, really just think objectively and understand that behind everyone telling you something, there is some sort of deeper message. So, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. I'm going to end with that. Um, I'm going to jump to, again, uh, talk about some of our events coming up. Uh, our next event coming up is February 20th through the 22nd at Hotel Casa Del Mar. It's the SWFI Institutional Investor Forum in Santa Monica. Great event, three days. Next event after that, that sanction, that's officially with us, is the Institute Fund Summit Asia in Japan, Tokyo, June 5th through 6th. And then our European event will be in Rome. And if you want to learn more details about our events, just go to ifsummit.com, ifsummit.com. I-F-S-U-M-M-I-T dot com and all the contact information is there. Right. So I just talked about Bitcoins and all this kind of interesting places. Um, I want to switch over to ESG, Environmental Social Governance Investing, and some updates in ESG. So as you know, um, a lot of sovereign wealth funds met in France at the Paris uh, event, uh, talking about climate change and other things. In fact, a number of wealth funds came together, like the Planeteers, right? Um, they had the <laughs> One Planet Sovereign Wealth Fund Working Group, and that's a mixture of the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, Kuwait Investment Authority, um, Norges Bank Investment Management, Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund, the New Zealand Superannuation Fund, and Qatar Investment Authority. 
and basically to address you know the need for taking to into account um, the environment when investing um, and different wealth funds will have different interpretations of that some will hey I don't want any carbon investments or I want a low carbon portfolio and you're asking what is carbon you know low carbon mean it's not low carb like the diet right uh, <laughs> you know keto diet um, low carbon means basically taking a lot of the fossil fuels out of your portfolio essentially um, and actually there's a number of different definitions of low carbon investing but that definition I feel is most efficient and kind of captures it in the essence of it and so again um, it just shows that uh, the reins of ESG the environmental is definitely getting stronger in fact um, ABP which is a Dutch pension fund uh, after a long meeting with their board director stakeholders they decided to drop tobacco investments and nuclear nuke investments from their its portfolio. Uh, so that will take about a year's time span. Um, let me figure out how much was in it. It was about 3.3 .3 billion euro, which is a very small part of the scheme of things, um, but it just shows that uh, the sort of avoidance types of investments or, or the avoidance strategy. Basically, there's the avoidance strategy and then there's the uh, stakeholder strategy, right? The avoidance strategy basically means, hey, this is a sin stock or I don't want to support this industry. I'm going to take this out of my portfolio. I don't want this to be a part of me. And um, that is gaining traction with a lot of U.S. pensions when it comes to tobacco stocks or private prisons, right? Um, and then there's the other school of thought say, hey, you know, you know, this company's not going to go away. They're going to be a big part of the market. Let me try to affect change on the board. Let me try to uh, push our opinions onto the corporate board and affect change there. So, for example, if you're a large manufacturer and you want to affect climate change in terms of uh, having the company use less fossil fuels and basically lower their CO2 emissions, you could have that company use solar panels for their super facilities versus you know, gas powered generators. Now, we can go into a large debate here about what's the most optimal way to power a server farm. Um, obviously, you want backup generators, but um, anyways, that's another discussion at one time. But uh, it just shows that, yes, there are two schools of thought, and I think the avoided school is winning because I'm seeing, you just read the financial press every day, it's like, oh, I'm going to drop this, I'm going to drop that. And, uh, you know, whether it's an endowment, there's a bunch of students protesting, hey, I want you to divest from this country, or divest from that country, or, or divest from this industry, or divest from that industry. I think the avoidance approach is definitely stronger. Um, but there's been, you know, there's been some pushback on that. And like I said, um, especially if a fund is a big index investor, you know, is that really going to move the needle? I mean, if they're 0.001% invested in this area, is that really going to change much? Anyways, uh, and it ends up costing more because of the making that index uh, very special and unique. So those are some changes going on there. Let me jump to some other just highlights of the day. Um, the Bank of Japan. So let's talk about central banking news, okay? So um, quantitative easing. And I remember a two, three years back, we're like, when's it going to end? When's it going to end? You know, we're just pumping money. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And it's being reflected in the equity markets today. We're seeing a lot of um, money floating around in the markets. And, uh, you know, with the uh, tax reform news, you have QE. That's why you're seeing the market goes to such highs. There's confidence. Uh, you see bonuses being awarded by a lot, of, a lot of U.S. companies because of the tax bill. So they can repatriate some profits back. So you see a bunch of, you know, Edge of Walmart just announced wage increases. Um, but then I just saw that... I guess Sam's Club is looking to shutter stores. Um, 63 Sam Club locations will be shut down. Well, Sam's Club, for my international audience, is sort of like a, a wholesale uh, uh, gymnasium where they offer goods at a bulk price, like Costco, right? Uh, Walmart's gonna shutter 63 of those, according to news here that's breaking. But um, again, Walmart, uh, they, they did get raises and it increased their minimum wages. In fact, a lot of the states uh, passed laws to increase their minimum wage, okay? And uh, just today, the Dow's breaking 200 points um, led by Boeing, okay? So 
I want to jump back to the QE, which I was talking about. The Bank of Japan revealed its intentions that they plan to cut back on long-dated government bond purchases, Japanese government bonds, aka in, in the world of bond trading, JGBs. And on January, on January 9th, that was announced that BOJ would lower its buying of JGBs with maturities between 10, 25 years to 190 billion yen, uh, basically cutting back the 10 to 25 years and those maturing between 25 to 40 years by 10 billion each. Also, the uh, European Union, the European Central Bank, uh, released minutes basically saying, quote unquote, um, communication setup should be a continued, quote unquote, continued robust and increasingly self sustaining economic expansion. So the ECB is basically buying 30 billion euro worth of bonds each month. Um, that program should be ending in this September. And again, it's part of the QE program. To date, since 2015, the ECB has bought about $2.3 trillion worth of QE. I'm sorry, $2.3 trillion worth of bonds for the QE program. $2.3 trillion worth of bonds for the QE program since 2015. And uh, another segue to that is that um, there was a bond that they invested into, Steinoff, that got caught with a lot of, I believe, accounting fraud, and that stock just went down the tubes. And uh, the ECB had about $100 million reportedly invested in that bond. They did get rid of it. So um, that is the news on quantitative in, uh, easing and the changes there. Um, some other changes that are going on right now, uh, APG, which is, I talked about them earlier, which is the manager of ABP, the Dutch uh, pension giant, um, Devin Hines uh, backed a 450 million euro development in Dublin called New Cherrywood. Basically, any of my Irish colleagues out there, anybody living in Ireland right now, there is a housing shortage. And um, there's been, you know, their banks have been uh, having a very tough time since the global financial crisis, right? Uh, pretty much took down the economy. And so there is a need for capital to flow into Ireland. A lot of private equity funds and firms and government back entities like the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund have tried to catalyze the construction industry, thus create jobs and also uh, provide the housing necessary to, for a growing economy, right? Because Ireland should be a benefit of Brexit. Um, so uh, that's a deal that was penned between APG and Heinz, 450 million euro. New Cherrywood, again, more details are off our website at swinstitute.org or of our global asset owner terminal, swfi.com, okay? Uh, let's see here. Another news going to Africa. A lot of news in the African sovereign wealth fund world. The Angolan president appointed a new head for Fundo Soberano de Angola, FSDEA, that's Angola Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, Jose is leaving the fund. Uh, he's been with the fund since its founding. And they replaced him with the former Angolan finance minister, who's currently the Secretary of Social Affairs, Carlos Alberto Lopez. And uh, he will be um, running the new Angolan Sovereign Wealth Fund. Another bit of news here, uh, the Securities and Exchange Board of India has banned, banned Price Waterhouse Coopers from auditing listed companies in India for two years. Obviously, PwC is is appealing this ruling, and they they're ordering a stay on it. But the SEBI, which is the Securities and Exchange Board of India, this is the stock regulator, they issued a 108 page scathing report on the auditor, basically that PwC was neglectful and they failed to uh, identify anomalies when they were an auditor. Uh, for Satyam Computer Services, which is no longer a company. Basically, that company uh, for a number of years uh, puffed up its revenue by creating over 7,500 fake invoices. Um, and that hurt a lot of investors, right? Because investors rely on good financial statements. And um, when a firm basically doesn't, um, if those numbers aren't trustworthy, it, it has a terrible impact on capital markets, investors lose confidence, and that really affects, um, you know, stock market growth. And, you know, that's why the U.S. is a very strong market. Yeah, there is accounting fraud, but uh, the controls are there. And people in India call this the Enron scandal of India. But 
the revelation of Satyam's, uh, you know, um, activities started. Uh, it was revealed on in January of 2009. So this goes back uh, almost a decade. But uh, PWC is now paying for its sins of the past um, uh, from the uh, SEBI. But we will see if the appeal, um, you know, if, if PwC can appeal this. But again, not being able to audit companies for two years from listed companies when India's equity market is is really growing fast. Uh, it's, it's, it's a blow for the accounting firm. So uh, that is a very interesting development there. Uh, let's see. Oh, on another note, if you don't know, SWFI tracks RFPs and opportunities. So we go out there and we look at RFPs from pension funds, endowments, and sovereign funds, and we post them. And so if you want to subscribe to our platform, you get access to RFPs and business opportunities. So if you're a fund manager and uh, you're looking to land deals, this is a great opportunity. Or if you are an asset owner and you want to see what other funds and pensions are looking to allocate to, then it's a great service. It's called SWFI Compass, and it's part of the SWFI subscription. In addition, we also do a thing called Opportunities, which uh, we go out and we look at trends where we think that sovereign wealth funds and pensions are going to allocate capital to. So if a sovereign fund makes a bunch of hires um, and they've stated that they want to go in certain areas and mixed in with our intelligence, um, you have a pretty good indicator on if this is going to happen, if a wealth fund is going to put money into a credit strategy or if a wealth fund is looking more at South Korean equity small cap, right? So that's part of SDFI Compass. Again, uh, we have a broad range of features within our platform. That is one of the features is, is SWFI Compass, but a lot of our asset management clients love it. And a lot of the asset owners that subscribe to our product really do use it, use it as a service to see what peers are doing. Uh, so that's a little plug there with our subscription service, and you can learn more about it. Again, going off swfinstitute.org. All right. I'm going to end this podcast to keep it short because it is Thursday and uh, I know people want to get their weekend started. Um, I want to talk about Saudi Aramco and the update there because this is a very topical issue. Saudi Aramco is basically those funds from the proposed IPO are going to go into the public investment fund and that's going to start to rival or, or try to get to the size of the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. It could, it could surpass it, right, depending on how much Saudi Aramco could get for its listed 5% stake that it plans to IPO. Uh, the Saudi Aramco deal is part of Vision 2030. Basically, Saudi Arabia is trying to modernize. They're trying to create jobs and, and bring more technology to the country. That's why they have this uh, conference, the Future Investment Initiative, back in late October in Riyadh. I actually went to it. It was a great event. Um, and they're trying to build a city called Neon, the city of the future. Uh, so going back to what's going on uh, in my notes here, uh, there's a number of large bulge bracket investment banks vying to lead the IPO. At the moment, uh, it look, looks like Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, and Deutsche Bank could be the lead for the IPO of the Saudi Aramco. And we'll have more details on that as time progresses. But... Uh, this is going to be a big deal. Again, I, I think that this is something that um, is going to have a tremendous impact in the world's summer wolf funds and in just might be a milestone I, IPO transaction. God bless you. Anyways, um, thank you for joining me on Follow the Money Show. You can visit the show off YouTube. You can visit the show off followthemoneyshow.com and our various other media platforms. If you like what you're seeing right now, click on the subscribe button below. Click on the subscribe button below, or please feel free to leave me a comment. I look forward to, um, you know, from your comments and critiques. Please, uh, uh, you know, feel free to opine on me. So anyways, um, have a wonderful day, and this is Follow the Money Show. Michael Mattel out.